presence is rarely one of active engagement. Consumption is a matter of receiving pleasure, of incorporating, taking it in. One reaches out, of course, in order to obtain that pleasure. But the reaching out generally comes in the form of payment rather than active participation, production, or creation. The pleasure for which one reaches, however, is a pleasure in the present moment. As Eastern thinkers sometimes have it, one lives in the now. However, in contrast to Eastern philosophies, that living rests not upon the shedding of temporal fetters, but precisely on the most passing of those fetters. Or, if we think of things from the opposite direction, the pleasure one obtains is only momentary. So we must move pleasure from pleasure to pleasure. As Bauman argues, quote, satisfaction must be only a momentary appearance, something to be feared rather than coveted if it lasts too long, end quote. The investor's relationship to the future is also straightforward. One invests for the sake of future return. To be sure, one envisions the present down the road in which the return will be had. But inasmuch as one is investor, that present never <laughs> arrives. The return that comes to one in the present is either, is either turned into consumption or else is capital of one form or another to be further invested for the sake of further future return. Friendship certainly enjoys the present and envisions the future. But friendships of the type we are discussing here are often founded on a rich, even if brief, past. And here is where my reply to Derrida is rooted. If Derrida misses the context of friendship in his argument for the necessity of an economy of the gift, that context is largely framed by a past. Recall Telfer's first condition of friendship, shared activities. When one begins to share activities with another, one would generally be reluctant to call the relationship with that other a friendship. There could be a spark there, as when two people recognize mutual interests or enthusiasms or a common way of seeing things. However, the friendship itself develops over time. It is the temporal thickness of shared activity that creates a friendship. In contrast to Derrida's view of the economy of the gift, what that temporal thickness does is not so much to create a balance, of, balance sheet of debts, but to erase, or at least efface, the very idea of such a balance sheet. It is not difficult to see why. As friendships develop, the part, their participants are often doing one thing or another for the friend in the midst of the shared activity. This doing for one another, in the uh, context of shared activity, creates a bond, what Telfair calls a passion that draws the friends to do things for one another, and as Aristotle would have it, for the sake of the other. This passion and this doing is sometimes described as the facing of the borders between friends. It is often better characterized, I think, as the facing of the economy of debts that drives so many other relationships. Sharing a common bond rooted in temporal thickness, friendship does not so much do away with the general borders between individuals as with, as with specific borders erected by economistic self-understandings. If this articulation of the possibilities of friendship is right, we may understand Foucault's point about friendship as a way of life, as threatening to the social order, by offering ways to form new alliances and new lines of force. These new alliances and lines of force consist in meaningful ways of conducting our lives with one another that resist the reduction to the figures of neoliberalism. They resist the economy of investment and return and the translation of relationships into forms of consumption. This in itself offers a vision of social interaction beyond the confines of the neoliberal order, one that is inimical to it precisely because it characterizes some of our most significant relationships. We can, I believe, however, go a step further in this direction. This next step will lead us from Foucault's suggestion to Rancière's politics. And the suggestion I want to make here is that some of the themes of the kinds of friendship I've isolated may also be a strong contributor to an egalitarian politics. It is what might be meant by the term trust we saw in uh, the citation from Rancière at the outset. Kant writes that, quote, the relationship of friendship is a relationship of equality. A friend, bears my losses because, uh, a friend who bears my losses becomes my benefactor and puts me in his debt. I feel shy in his presence and cannot look him boldly in the face. The true relationship of friendship is canceled and friendship ceases." End quote. Kant's argument here, this is the part I want to focus on, is that friendship requires a delicate balance between how much is asked and offered from one friend to another, a point we discussed a moment ago. But there's another way to take this citation. 
Friendships, at least those characterized by the themes we are discussing here, are relations of equality. We might amend Kant by saying that they are also that they are relations of equality not simply because of the general balance of giving and receiving, but also and more deeply because in many cases that balance does not even come into play. That is to say, I look at my friend as an equal, not because he or she is equal in measure to me, but because equality of this type is to a certain extent outside of measure. The equality here is an equality of two or more people who take one another as equals, not in this or that characteristic, but as we might say, equals period. This equality is, in Rossi's view, the basis for democratic politics. He writes, quote, political activity is always a mode of expression that undoes the perceptible divisions of the police order by implementing a basically heterogeneous assumption, the equality of any speaking being with any other speaking being. End quote. What the assumption of equality accomplishes is to challenge the hierarchical order, what Rancier calls the police order of, the mo of most social arrangements. To act democratically is to act collectively on the presupposition of the equality of anyone and everyone. To do so, as the citation we saw earlier notes, is to act with a sort of collective trust. The suggestion I want to make here is that modes of friendship that resist the figures of neoliberalism in some of their elements offer both models of and roots toward such a democratic politics. Rothschild claims that, quote, the essence of equality is in fact not so much to unify as to declassify, to undo the supposed naturalness of orders and replace it with the controversial figures of division, end quote. The supposedly natural figures of the neoliberal order are, as we've seen, the entrepreneur and the consumer. In taking friendship as without measure, and the way we have described, in seeing friends as those whose stakes are importantly our stakes, in resisting the reduction of social relationships to pleasures or investments, what emerges is precisely a declassification in Rancière's sense. It is not in the name of something else, unless we want to call that something else either equality or perhaps friendship itself, that the figures of neoliberalism are challenged. It is instead for a type of relationship without hierarchy, or with at least as little, as hi little hierarchy as our age permits. Moreover, as Marilyn Friedman points out, the fact that friendship is a voluntary relationship allows it to act as an egalitarian type of relationship that cuts across the traditional structures of a police order and allows alternative and disruptive communities to form. She notes that, quote, because of its basis in voluntary choice, Friendship is more likely than many other relationships, such as those of family and neighborhood, to be grounded and sustained by shared interests and values, mutual affection, and the possibilities for generating reciprocal respect and esteem, end quote. And that, end quote, friendship, more than many other relationships, can provide social support for people who are idiosyncratic, whose unconventional values and deviant lifestyles make them victims of intolerance from family members and others who are involuntarily related to them, end quote. <laughs> this, she points out, is essential to feminist formulations of solidarity, which face steep and often violent resistance to their challenges to traditional sex and gender roles. One might want to argue here against Friedman's last point, that it is one of the virtues of neoliberalism, that it has undermined traditional gender, role, gender roles, equal, equalizing everyone in the face of globalized market exchange. This argument, however, would be wrong on two counts. First, women, particularly in less technologically developed countries, have not so much been liberated from traditional gender roles as, as shifted from one set of oppressive roles to another. For instance, in many of the export processing zones developed by transnational corporations and described so well by Naomi Klein, women are drawn into exploitative work whose effects are little more than to trade in being at the bottom of, the traditional, of a traditional social ladder for being at the bottom of a neoliberal one. David Harvey notes that, quote, accumulation by dispossession typically undermines whatever powers women may have had within traditional household production, marketing systems, and within traditional structures and markets. The paths of women's liberation from traditional patriarchal controls in developing countries seem to lie in neoliberalism, either through degrading factory labor or trading on sexuality, end quote. Second, the promised equality is not the kind of equality that Friedman thinks of as the basis of feminist emancipation. What she calls idiosyncratic or deviant lifestyles do not consist in buying goth clothes and hot topic. 
The art says, experiments in different forms of non-exploitative personal relationships, as Foucault would have it, friendships as a way of life. All of this is what allows certain aspects of friendship, friendships of this type, to be both models for and roots toward a democratic politics. They are a model for such politics because they show what it can look like. Friendship can give a picture of solidarity, which is no mean feat in an era of rampant individualism. Moreover, it offers both a route, to, it offers a route toward such politics. Friendship can be a movement of solidarity. It presupposes the equality of its participants, and it such trains those participants in the mode of political solidarity required by democratic movements. Friendship can find a know-how uh, that is the ground for progressive political solidarity. By cutting against the figures of neoliberalism, it cultivates an alternative form of social interaction that is a requirement of any movement that would effectively counter neoliberal domination. This cultivation is a necessary element of building an alternative set of social relationships. In a recent article entitled Fetishizing Process, the philosopher Mark Lance intervenes in the traditional debate among anarchists regarding whether voting or consensus respects the equality of participants by arguing that the focus on process often misses the significance of the training and self-training of those participants. Lance's claim is that we often expect to design processes that will guarantee respect for persons when in fact, the processes themselves only work when that respect has been instilled. He writes, quote, an anti-authoritarian democratic organization must not understand itself as defined by a set of formal procedures. Rules can be used as tools of a virtuous community with a largely functional practice, but they should be no more than tools, end quote. Although it does not refer to the figures of neoliberalism, one can see why the cultivation of such virtues as respect for and solidarity with others is particularly urgent in light of how we are being molded by current social, economic, and political forces. And cultivation is not all. Friendship is also motivating. Friendships, after all, are among the most rewarding of our social relationships. We, will, we will often like others among our relationships to share at least certain characteristics with, with friendship. Not that we can consider all of our social relations to be friendships, that would require, of course, too much commitment to too many people. However, most of us would find it a better world in which we could trust one another a little more, feel a little less in competition with one another, and feel a little less a means to others' ends. By modeling such relationships, friendship can not only offer the preparation for political solidarity, it can also show us in the intimacy of our particular worlds what a better world looks like. It can, and it can motivate us to achieve such a world. I'd like to close with two objections, both of which can be drawn from Derrida's politics of friendship. The first objection concerns how far the net of friendship can be spread. The second one, following from the first, seeks to question the coherence of the concept of friendship itself. And as for the, fir as for the first, Derrida notes that there is a tension between friendship and a democratic politics that, in that friendship can only extend it to a limited number of people. He writes, quote, it is not possible to love while one is simultaneously at the same time the friend of numerous others. The numerous ones, the numerous others. This means neither number nor multiplicity in general, but too great a number, end quote. Friendship requires spending time and expending emotion on those one befriends. It is impossible to engage in this level of interpersonal concentration with numerous people, especially in the kinds of friendship we have sketched here. For a friendship to move beyond the parameters set by the figures of neoliberalism, there needs to be a level of involvement that precludes the possibility of drawing the circle of one's friends very wide. As a result, one might see friendship not as we have suggested